The following presentation is not rated. It contains mild violence and adult content. Viewer discretion advised. Nobody g gave a darn about Eddie, you know, when he was alive, and even less when he died, and, um, and all of a sudden... <laughs> I have told the almost unbelievable, related the unreal, and showed it to be more than a fact. Now I tell a tale of the threshold people, so astounding that some of you may faint. This is a story of those in the twilight time, once human, now monsters, in a void between the living and the dead. Monsters to be pitied, monsters to be despised. The ghouls reborn from the innermost depths of the world. Of all the threshold people who labored in the twilight time of low-budget exploitation, one name stands out, Edward D. Wood, Jr. Eddie Wood made movies about monsters, crime, sex, and violence, all on non-existent budgets, but always with poetically bizarre dialogue, microphone reflections, continuity errors, and weirdly mismatched stock footage gave his films the mind-bendingly unreal air of a bad dream. Then is now. A lot of people dismiss his films as low-budget trash. So oh, what? <laughs> In fact, his Plan 9 from Outer Space is widely considered one of the worst films ever made. That's the understatement of the year. But all of his films are hysterically serious and madly autobiographical. One is always considered mad. One discovers something that others cannot grasp. Ed Wood made movies like nobody else. They're cheap, poorly acted, ineptly assembled, but never dull. Like a car wreck, they're grotesquely fascinating, with a movie consistency, a magical individual resonance. Wood's films have become true cult classics, triumphs over all obstacles, including his own singular lack of ability. And the facts of Ed's own life were as tragic dramatic, wild, and ironic as any he dreamed for the screen. Strange sort of bird. Entrepreneur, loyal friend, playboy, satyr, alcoholic, pornographer, and a transvestite with a fetish for Angora. Sounds like a man I'd like to meet. He probably will. He died alone, rejected by the business that he loved. Most of us have our idiosyncrasies. This fellow's was quite pronounced. Yes, but I wonder if it rated the death warrant it received. His wife of 20 years, a fellow Marine, a low-budget producer, a loyal friend, and his leading lady will help tell the story. I'd like to hear the story to the fullest. Only the infinity of the depths of a man's mind can really tell the story. But this is Ed Wood's own story in his voice and in the voices of the characters from the infinite depths of his mind. No one can really tell the story. Mistakes are made. But there is no mistaking the thoughts in a man's mind.
A new life is begun. No child is inherently bad. Adults create the world children live in. And in this process, parents play the key role. Glenn's father had no love for his son. His father wanted Glenn to be a football hero or a baseball player so that he could brag to his cronies down at the corner saloon as his cronies bragged to him about their own sons. The sins of a father? I will leave my father out of this. That plus the lack of a mother's attention. After school, Alan would go home to find the mother who had always wanted a girl and the father who didn't care one way or the other. Little Eddie Wood, his parents called him Junior, took sanctuary in the cinema, a fantasy dream world where good and bad were clearly defined. Even more than his cowboys, he loved his monsters, Dracula, the Wolfman, the Mummy. He was drawn to play acting, making amateur movies, and wearing costumes. You want to borrow your sister's dress? What for? I want to wear it to the Halloween party. There are names for boys who go around wearing girls' clothes. Oh, don't be silly, darling. You go ahead and wear your sister's dress, Glenn. You always did look much better as a girl than you do as a man. Glenn did wear the dress to the Halloween party. He even took first prize. Then one day, it wasn't Halloween any longer. Eddie Wood invented a female persona for himself. He called himself Shirley. And the way I get it, this character he created, much as an author creates a character in a book, was invented as a love object to take the place of the love he never received in his early youth through lack of it from his parents. Well, well what are you trying to do, psychoanalyze me? I don't think he ever did tell me why, you know. He liked the, liked the softness of certain fabrics. Then came the fateful year of 1941. He successfully passed his vigorous training. He did not like it, and there were the weekends for his particular diversion. Then the day of embarkation came. It was rain, he was decorated, he was in Tarawa. 4,000 boys went in and, and 300 came out. He was one of the 300. But underneath his battle fatigues, he wore a red bra and red panties. And he always told me that he just, he hoped that he was killed. He didn't want to be wounded because he could never explain the red panties and the bra. Then, as quickly as it had begun, the war was over. He was honorably discharged from the service at the end of the war. He'd received the Silver Star and the Bronze Star for gallantry in action. While he was in an army hospital recuperating from a wound he'd received in New Guinea, he learned a very interesting fact. The fact was that the G.I. Bill could put him through school. Ed studied art and drama, joined a traveling carnival, and headed west to make movies. Ah, the curiosity of youth on the road to ruin. May it ever be so adventurous. Ed Wood wanted to be part of the Hollywood dream. In 1947, he sought work as a writer, director, or actor. Considering when a guy came to Hollywood, didn't know a soul, he wanted to get into the picture business, and how many millions of people come to Hollywood, he was going to be another Orson Welles. He was looking for actresses, and uh, it took my girlfriend, Mona McKinnon, who later did Plan 9 from Outer Space. I told him how handsome he was. And before the interview was over, he told me he was going to make me a star, <laughs> the old wine. <laughs> we were living together, and it was uh, scandalous at the time. But he told everybody that we were married. Uh, at first, anyway, the first year, he always hid uh, the fact that he liked to cross-dress. I had a very big bar big one called Surf Girl. And the next thing I know, he comes in, and he's Shirley. I enjoyed him. He was very, very funny, but kind of shocking. Well, it was strange at first, because like I said, I was very naive. I didn't know that much about these things. Young guy at 17. And then he would ask to borrow my Angora sweater. And, you know, I said, well, why? <laughs> and uh, he says, well, 
I'm getting into this woman's part, and it makes the juices flow. I had another inkling when I was missing some of my soft undies. Where did they go? How did they disappear? He wrote and directed a play based on his war experiences. It flopped miserably. But he did find work at Universal Studios in the scheduling department. But he wanted to put his own dreams on film. His chance came in 1953. Producer George Weiss conceived a film to cash in on the Christine Jorgensen story, a man who had his sex surgically changed to female. But as writer and director, Ed turned the movie into the ultimate in self-expression. Glenn or Glenda? Give this man satin undies, a dress, a sweater, and a skirt, or even the lounging outfit he has on, and he's the happiest individual in the world. He can work better, think better, he can play better, and he can be more of a credit to his community and his government because he is happy. Glenn is a transvestite, but he is not a homosexual. Transvestism is the term given by medical science to those persons who desperately wish to wear the clothing of the opposite sex yet whose sex life in all instances remains quite normal. Ed also starred under the name Daniel Davis. Davis was his middle name, but he wanted something more for his film, a star to give it credibility. Say, why don't you try to get that actor, uh, Bela Lugosi? It's right up his alley. Lugosi was old, addicted to painkillers, and considered a has-been by Hollywood. Awestruck, Ed approached his idol with an offer of 500 bucks. Lugosi passed. Bela's wife Lillian changed his mind. They needed the cash. So for a thousand bucks, Bela spent a day playing an ambivalent spirit in an armchair, spouting intense and baffling metaphors. Only Ed Wood would have dared cast Dracula as God. People. All going somewhere. with their own thoughts, their own ideas, all with their own personalities. This surreal juxtaposition of stock footage, compassion, exploitation, and metaphysics was too weird for mainstream, way too mild for burlesque theaters. It bombed. Undaunted, Ed tried again. He'd always loved westerns as a little boy, and television was gobbling new material like crazy. B-movie western stars like Roy Rogers, Gene Autry, and Hopalong Cassidy had found new audiences on TV. Ed shot a 16-millimeter pilot show for a series to be called Crossroads Avenger. He cast the film with his childhood favorites, old Bud Osborne, scowling Kenny Duncan, Tom Tyler, who had also played Captain Marvel and The Mummy, and Tom Keene. Done your last killing. What's your name, mister? Duke. Duke Smith. A lot of Dukes around lately. Funny thing is, they all seem to end in Smith. Duke Smith is good enough for the time being. Sure, Tom Tyler's arthritis made gunplay a little awkward, but the film wasn't much worse than the B Westerns of Eddie's childhood. The problem was, this was 1953, not 1933. You're a pretty smart deputy. Sheriff, now. That's right, and you're going to be a smart one, too. Well, I got to be hitting the trail again. Eddie told friends that the TV network passed on the show in favor of Wild Bill Hickok. This was a diplomatic way of putting it. Instead, he was hired to direct and co-write Jailbait. A crime thriller with a twist ending involving plastic surgery and mistaken identities. It was foolish to try to make a good movie on the ridiculously low budget. Twenty-three grand. That's how much of a fool I am. Hello, Miss Gregor. Oh, Lieutenant Lawrence. I just he had been Mr. Universe now. and Mr. America. When it came to the, the kiss, uh, he didn't react to me. 
And I was prepared to kind of melt into it and give it all I had. And he didn't return anything. So I just thought, gee, it'd been a lot better if he'd helped. <laughs> when Lugosi fell ill, the part of the plastic surgeon was filled by silent movie star Herbert mm. Rawlinson, himself suffering from lung cancer. You know, I had to perform a very difficult operation this morning, the victim of an automobile accident. You know that I had to remodel that patient's entire face, and it was strenuous and very, very complicated. Plastic surgery at times seems to me to be very, very complicated. The morning after he finished his scenes, Rawlinson died. Even with two features to his credit, Ed remained outside looking in. He talked portrait photographer Ted Allen into a partnership to make a horror film with Lugosi. Allen lit the sets like cabinet of Dr. Caligari, but the money ran out in just three days. Eddie was never good at raising money for his pictures. We uh, were introduced to Loretta King, who um, supposedly had a great deal of money. She looked at the script and uh, picked out my part and said, whoa, this is a part I'd like to do. <laughs> and uh, so if she put up the money, she wanted the part. The twist ending. Loretta King had no money to invest. Ed Wood gave Dolores Fuller a walk on, and she walked out. I didn't hear you. I said I know what you said, but I didn't hear you. I get it. Months later, Ed convinced his leading man, Tony McCoy, to get his father to refinance the film. Ed assured them both it would be a hit. Sounds logical. Whatever you say. With a small crew, Ed started again. Wrestler Tor Johnson played Bela's mute henchman Lobo. The lab set included a refrigerator and stove for late night snacks. Despite the oft repeated rumor, Bela does not call Lobo as gentle as a kitchen. Don't be afraid of Lobo. He's as gentle as a kitten. Ed had sold all rights to the McCoys. He never saw any of the profits. As a writer, Ed tackled juvenile delinquency with a sex switch on gang movies. Playboy playmate Gene Moorhead played a sweet high school girl by day, butch gang leader by night. Take that sweater off. But what right you Shut up and do like she says. Do what they say, Shirley. They've got guns. Yes, Shirley, we've got guns. You're very observant for a pretty boy. For God's sake, Cheryl, take this sweater off. Give it to her. The film made hundreds of thousands of dollars and played for years. Ed made less than 500 bucks for the script. In 1955, Bela Lugosi publicly admitted a drug habit, decades before detox became fashionable. When he was released, he was optimistic and ready to work. You're leaving the... State Hospital tomorrow. Yes, I'm very happy I do, on account that I became a, a new man, new lease of life. I'm cured. You're cured. You I feel, feel like a million dollars. You feel like Frankie really felt, huh? Sure. Yeah. That is best. I'm looking forward to work again. I understand that. I had an assignment uh, playing the star part in uh, The Guru Goes West. Uh -huh. Yes. And uh, Eddie Woods is going to be the yeah. producer. And you're going to enter that as soon as you leave here. Surely. I was supposed to play in a, a part in a western, which I was really looking forward to, called The Ghoul Goes West. The Ghoul Goes West would have combined Edward's love of cowboys and monsters with Lugosi as a mysterious mortician. Ed's dream cast would have included horror and western veterans John Carradine and Lon Chaney Jr. Faith in the project gave Bela hope while he was undergoing drug rehabilitation. And while he was there, millionaire cowboy singer Gene Autry seemed to ride to the rescue, telling newspapers, I'll make the ghoul goes west only if Bela Lugosi does the horror part. Eddie told me that. He told me that he talked to Autry, and um, that he was had a slight interest, and that I think Eddie had probably mentioned that Go Lugosi would do the, the ghoul. But evidently, Gene Autry watched a couple of Ed's movies. I think I'd better not. Ed did raise $800 to shoot a few minutes of Bela in his Dracula outfit. Nice, 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 nice! But Bela died a few weeks later. At his request, he was buried in the cape of Count Dracula. Ed Wood cobbled together a sci-fi horror script called Brave Robbers from Outer Space, 
but he needed to stretch those few precious moments of Lugosi footage. A situation easily remedied. He simply dressed his chiropractor in a black cape. If the people in this photograph could suddenly come to life, it can be anyone, my friend. Anyone. In this makeup, it might be even I. It didn't fool anybody, but it almost made sense. Bela covered his face the same way in Abbott and Costello meet Frankenstein. For it once that he had some money behind him that he could could count on. He'd have to run out every once in a while and get some more to keep the picture going, you know. A low-budget movie that was maybe filmed for about 15,000, no more than 20. Aliens from a distant galaxy attempt to save Earth from itself by reviving the corpses of Earth people. An ex-Marine airline pilot punches out the peace-loving alien and the flying saucer explodes. That's the plot in a nutshell. Shot in five days, it was the Alpha and Omega of Ed Wood's career. The title was the first thing to be changed. The Baptist who funded the film thought grave robbers from outer space was sacrilegious. Audiences sat in awe and disbelief. It was a horror movie without horror. A science fiction movie with no science and very little fiction. Zombies, guided by a master plan, Plan 9 from outer space. So began a long descent into poverty and obscurity. Why then is he remembered? Because Ed Wood had a vision. Is that the end of the story? Not quite. I'll get back to it in a minute. Beware of the big green dragon that sits on your doorstep. He eats little boys. Bobby Duck tails and big fat snails. My mind's in a muddle. I cannot pick fog. I can't make sense to myself sometimes. You see? You see? Your stupid minds! Stupid! Stupid! The world is a strange place to live in. All those cars, all going someplace, all caring humans which are carrying out their lives. I don't know what you're talking about. Calling an Ed Wood script illogical is like saying dreams make no sense. Images and words went straight from his mind to the page. The way I work, bad. His stream of consciousness dialogue was like a ransom note pasted together from words randomly cut out of a Korean electronics manual. I guess I've seen everything there is for a policeman to see. Yet I wonder if we ever stop learning. Learning about which we see. Trying to learn more about uh, an ounce of prevention. This type of case comes to me as well as yourself, many times during the course of one month. It's tough to find something when you don't know what you're looking for. There's no such thing as monsters. This is the 20th century. Don't count on it. Although I've never even met the gentleman, but Inspector John, he seems like a, a fan of mine. This afternoon we had a long telephone conversation earlier in the day. Eddie was, sometimes he was so serious in what he wrote but it didn't come out that way in the movie. <laughs> Why is it so important that you want to contact the governments of our Earth? Because all you of Earth are idiots. We did have a Bible there, and I did pick it up for some reason. You also think it impossible that we, too, might think of God? There was something, some passage in there, something about the solar. When you have the solar night, you have nothing. You speak of solar night. The solar night. So what if we do develop this solanite bomb? The solanite? That's all I'm taking from you. Get back here, you don't! Sexual imagery bubbled to the surface in the most unlikely places, like hickeys on laboratory victims. Rubble! You carrying a rod now? Sure. Flip it to me quick. What? Hey, Edie, how about you and me bottling it up in Albuquerque? And, uh, Bob, being a pretty girl, won't take any chances. That's a cute pair. They have their points.
pussycat is born to be wet. He shared his fetish with at least one character in everything he wrote. But at heart, he remained a ladies' man. Now I love girls. Girls, 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 tall ones, fat ones, skinny ones. It doesn't matter any kind of girl. Blonde, brunette, redhead. Girls, girls, girls. I have only one problem. There is no enough time for all of them. A marriage to Norma McCarthy lasted just long enough for Norma to meet Shirley. I don't put much stock in the future success of our married life. He's already you're holding out secrets on me. I used to drop in at this place on Sunset. He's sitting there at the bar all by himself, and his tears are rolling down his face. I always feel sorry for a lost puppy dog or a stray cat or a good-looking guy that's crying and I wanted to meet him. It's just like um, something was drawing us together. Kathy Wood stayed with him from 1956 till the bitter end. Do you love her? Very much. Does she love you? Yes. There's no problem. But there was a problem. Ed Wood had a date with destiny. Life is life. Many things are not of our choosing, but we must face that which is ordained us. Destiny is a strange and mysterious thing, my dear Inspector. With no money or time, Edward's filmmaking style had to be straightforward. Shoot first if I give the signal and ask questions later. So what he lacked in production value, he made up in enthusiasm, energy, and speed. But I'm going to let you in on a little secret of mine that I use all the time. And it's a great technique. If you want to use it, my technique, use it in good health. His secret was intercutting stock footage with new action. This technique can make a small picture look impressive when done right. Luckily, he rarely did it right. Here the Mad Doctor becomes an atomic superman. A stock shot lightning bolt causes a stock shot explosion and fire. The police try to kill Lugosi, but he deflects their bullets by twitching, shrugging, and making faces. A stock footage octopus attacks. The half-dressed hero rolls a paper mache boulder onto Bela Lugosi's stuntman. Bela flails with a flaxed rubber octopus stolen from Republic Studios, while a stock shot lightning bolt causes the atomic monsters to reach critical mass, transforming into a stock shot atomic explosion. But occasionally, Ed used stock shots as weird visual counterpoint. File footage of traffic in a foundry contrast with Wood's off screen plea for understanding. Every weekend and back to the sweatshop. Say, did you read about the guy that had his sex changed to a girl? Says he was perfectly normal, too. How can a guy be normal and go and do a thing like that to himself? Do you realize what would happen if every man in the country that wanted to wear women's clothes or felt like a woman went to their doctors and wanted a sex change? Of course. That's why I say perhaps society should be a little bit more lenient, but maybe society should try to understand them as human beings. Another day done, thank goodness. See you tomorrow, Jack. Yeah. So long, Joe. Until tomorrow. Wood's most alarming use of a stock shot was a buffalo stampede in Glen or Glenda. I hope not. I really hope not. Glenn, is it another woman? Only Ed could explain the significance. Hold up the strike! 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 H